Um, let me introduce our two speakers tonight. Dr. Kathy Wanner is a professor of history and anthropology and religious studies at Penn State. She is the author or editor of six books on Ukraine and three collections of essays on resistance and renewal during the Maidan protests. Her most recent book is Everyday Religiosity and the Politics of Belonging in Ukraine, which is coming out in 2022 through Cornell University Press. And it draws on 30 years of ethnographic and archival research in Ukraine. In 2020, she was awarded the Distinguished Scholar Prize from the Association for the Study of Eastern Christianity. And we are honored that she is here tonight to share her expertise with us on Ukraine. Um, Dr. Donna Berry is a professor emerita of pol uh, political science at Penn State. She does research on public opinion and behavior, federalism and ethnic politics in post-Soviet states and on democratization, corruption and leader turnover in de uh, democratic regimes. Her most recent publication is Executive Turnover and the Investigation of Former Leaders in New Democracies, um, which was published in Political Research Quarterly in 2021. We are very honored to have you both here with us tonight, and I will turn the floor over to Dr. Warner. Thank you, Jessica, for such a wonderful introduction. I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, I've spent 30 years uh, doing research uh, in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, and I have watched this uh, hybrid war accelerate. Um, getting us to the point where we are today. And so I hope that tonight I can perhaps offer um, uh, a deeper, if you will, or uh, an expanded perspective on, on these events and help you to see what are the sources and what are perhaps the potential consequences of, um, of this hybrid war. Um, the current crisis uh, in Ukraine um, has led to uh, over 100,000 troops um, it's hard to pinpoint the exact number at this point, um, all around Ukraine. There we go. Here's a map of Ukraine for you. So you can see um, the buildup of troops is all on these sides of Ukraine. And we now also have uh, significant uh, warships and naval infantry in the Black Sea area. Um, this current crisis, I think, is driven really by uh, two things that are not as often as they should be discussed in the media, and that's probably because they're slightly complicated. Um, I think th this uh, reveals uh, Russia's uh, frustrated imperial ambitions, for one. And for two, I think it also reflects Vladimir Putin's determination to stay in power and to uh, maintain his authoritarian style of rule. And it's the pursuit of those two goals uh, that have created this hybrid war and the securitization of religion that I'll speak a bit about later, um, as well as this most recent uh, troop buildup all around Ukrainian borders. So first, let me uh, give you a bit of background as to, I think, what has uh, uh, precipitated um, the, the current crisis that we're looking at today. So here's a, a map that shows you know, Ukraine superimplanted on the US to give you a sense that it's a fairly large country. It's the second largest country in Europe after Russia itself. And even after having lost 9% of its territory, it still has 44 million people. So um, you perhaps have often heard that uh, Vladimir Putin insists that Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Uh, this is something that he has said many times, and even over the summer, he penned a historical essay in which he actually uh, his, uh, provided a historical analysis that proved this. So this is what he means by that, and this is how he understands that kind of a statement. Uh, this is a map of Kiev and Rus, which was the um, original uh, state that has evolved now into the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, and Russia. Um, uh, according to Russian historical mythology, Kiev is the mother of Russian cities, and Khersonez, which you see here down on Crimea, this is uh, where the prince of Kiev and Rus was uh, originally baptized, thereby um, uh, bringing forth the advent of uh, Eastern Christianity in Kiev and Rus. 
Kievan Rus, the word Kievan, of course, refers back to the capital uh, of Ukraine. That's Kiev. It's the same one. And indeed, um, these events have ushered in a shared uh, confessional tradition of Eastern Christianity um, between Russians and Ukrainians. All of that, however, was in the 10th century, but it still uh, continues to uh, have reverberations today. Here is a, a more recent map, nonetheless, I think, which shows another element to this, um, to the difficulties that we're experiencing today. You'll see Ukraine um, is really a meeting place of borders, of imperial borders, to be more specific. Uh, the very name of the country, Ukraine, actually means borders. You see here the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth um, dominated a, a great deal of what is currently Ukraine. You see these green lines are the current borders of Ukraine. Um, being part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is what ushered in uh, Catholicism within uh, Ukraine. Those Eastern Christian communities then uh, recognized the authority of the Pope when they were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1596, thereby giving these Catholic communities very deep roots in this part of the world. <coughs> Excuse me, you also see on the right, the Russian Empire and its westward move. To the south, we have the Crimean Canopte. The Crimeans are a Turkic speaking Muslim people. <coughs> this imperial formation, evolved over time into the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the Western part of Ukraine, again, the Russian Empire, and then the Ottoman Empire to the South. Once the uh, USSR was formally established in 1922, you'll see that the Ukrainian Socialist Republic right here is quite a bit smaller than uh, Ukraine today. And that's because during World War II, uh, the Soviet Red Army, uh, under Stalin's direction, was able to push the borders of the Soviet Union westward. And in doing so, uh, Soviet Ukraine absorbed significant Polish, Czechoslovakian, Hungarian, and Romanian territories. And in doing so, it inherited a great number of religious communities who had not been subjected to the decades of Soviet anti-religious campaigns. As you might expect, um, it's this particular flank of the country that has historically been quite anti-Soviet. Those borders that were established in 1945 uh, remained in place uh, until 2014. And this is where uh, we have in 2014, the Russian annexation of Crimea, of Crimea this Crimean Peninsula here in the South, and here is where we have um, the war in the Donbass region on the eastern frontier of Ukraine. So let me give a, a bit of background as to how that kind of historical legacy uh, remains quite vibrant and alive uh, uh, in Ukraine today. Uh, you probably hear a great bit um, about NATO and NATO membership, should we allow Ukraine to, to join uh, and so on. Uh, in my view, uh, NATO is really very much, not even of a secondary, but really um, uh, an even less significant issue in this entire confrontation that we're witnessing today. Really what is at stake is membership in the European Union. As recently as 10 years ago, not even Ukrainian leaders were talking about NATO membership. Um, and even the optimists and the willing speak about at least 20 years before Ukraine joins and others still say Ukraine will never join. The same cannot be said about EU membership for which there has always been a steadfast intention among uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of, of the Ukrainian population. So first and foremost, this is about, uh, I believe ultimately European Union membership and the ultimate direction, both politically, uh, legally, and in terms of uh, the various kinds of social institutions that get, get created in Ukraine. I add parenthetically that um, this very crisis in Ukraine really affects, uh, we hear about Ukraine and the troop buildups all around here, but of course, <laughs> this entire corridor 
is really very much on high alert. Um, this is really a, a, a tremendous uh, jolt to the entire region. But to understand um, why uh, EU membership uh, is such a pivotal uh, matter in terms of the Russian troop buildup today, let's go back to uh, a presidential election in Ukraine in 2010. We might have uh, red and blue states, but they have blue and yellow states. In other words, their political landscape is every bit as polarized as our own. The only difference is uh, their polarization is geographically concentrated, which makes it um, uh, more difficult and cults even, cultivates even more perils. Um, the president who was elected in, in 2010 was very much of a pro-Russian um, president. He was from Donetsk. And he made what was for many Ukra Ukrainians uh, uh, an entirely shocking and unexpected decision on November 21st, 2013 to not join the European, uh, to not establish an association agreement even with the European Union in favor of uh, adopting a, uh, an agreement with the Eurasian Customs Union, which is of course led by uh, Vladimir Putin. This then triggered uh, what were called the Maidan protests. Uh, it was a tremendous outpouring of um, popular support for Europe. You'll notice in the background a great deal of uh, European Union flags. And at its height, it drew uh, approximately 1 million people. Um, it accelerated over time with people living, literally coming in from all parts of the country, living on the streets. Um, as the state responded with violence, the popular resolve only accelerated and the billowing black smoke that you see in the background is the burning of tires, which is what uh, many of the protesters um, made use of as a defense during these protests because by generating so much smoke, they thought that they're unlikely to shoot if they can't see. As this standoff really accelerated um, in February 2014, this pro-Russian president opened fire on the protesters and killed over 100 of them. Um, this then, once again, with each recourse to violence, only uh, intensified uh, the protests. And eventually this um, uh, pro-Russian president was forced to flee to Russia um, and his residence was with all of its opulence and uh, grotesque graft was open to the public as a museum of corruption. But with this, this was really, it was meant to be the beginning of something, but it ended up being the beginning of something entirely different. Um, you know, historians very often look at uh, continuities and ruptures so as to identify certain periods or certain errors. And I think more than anything else, 2014 um, definitively ended the Soviet era. Um, as this uh, pro-Russian president uh, fled the country, there was barely enough time to constitute a new government when uh, in the, on the Crimean Peninsula, we had what Ukrainians called little green men. What they meant by that were um, uh, soldiers in uniform, but those uniforms were unmarked. They staged a uh, referendum um, under their own supervision, which you won't be surprised to learn, uh, proved that the overwhelming majority uh, supported joining Russia uh, and those who were against that boycotted the referendum. And one month after that, you had um, backing from Russia in the form of weapons and actual soldiers that helped ignite an insurgency on Ukraine's eastern border, similarly in the name of achieving some degree of independence or annexation into Russia or some other kind of challenge to the Ukrainian state. Uh, as this accelerated, the Ukrainian forces launched a um, attacks on their own citizens. And with that, we have the beginning of a hybrid war. So you might say to yourself, what is a hybrid war? And this is really quite a new phenomenon, but I'm afraid that it's a phenomenon that is likely to be with us for quite some time, precisely because it's effective. It's a war in which there's no official declaration. And so as a result, it's unclear who is actually fighting in this war. Um, 
we know from those soldiers who have been captured alive, you have some Russian soldiers, you have some local Ukrainians, but you also have a plethora of mercenaries who come from the US, Canada, uh, Brazil, Serbia, I mean, a, a whole host of countries, including those countries that have had similar uh, incursions, if you will, from Russia. And by that, I mean, especially Chechnya and Georgia. But this is also a hybrid war uh, because of the tactics that are used. This war generates uh, a handful of casualties every week. It neither produces the single um, tragic death uh, nor the ambush that generates statistics. It's just a slow drip of death each week. It's also a war that relies on weapons beyond just guns, most notably um, words that have now entered our own vocabulary, disinformation, uh, deep fakes, and tetushkis means it's the use of someone who is posing as someone else, almost as a decoy, someone who acts as if they are local and they advocate a particular perspective, even though they are really um, a plant, if you will. Um, this has allowed the uh, flourishing of a variety of conspiracy theories and an overall disruption of the truth, which then not only destroys truth, but it also destroys trust and produces ignorance. So in a word, a hybrid war is less about weapons and it's more about weaponizing. So this then brings me to um, how religion has been first weaponized and, and uh, more recently securitized. If you look here, this is the landscape, um, uh, the religious landscape in Ukraine after the Maidan protests. And you'll see, for example, that there's no single dominant group. And I would draw your attention first and foremost to these large groups here of just Orthodox. In other words, people with some kind of confessional allegiance or someone who's totally a, a, a non-affiliated believer. These are very, this is a very significant group and it's this these people in particular who are under very, very um, uh, growing and intense, intensifying pressures to actually make a choice. In posing what the choice is, we have a religion becoming something of a proxy war, if you will, another layer in which this standoff between Russia and Ukraine occurs. First, the Russians pioneered um, this idea of a Russian world, which um, especially as of 2013, just prior, and then especially thereafter, after the Maidan, took on real religious overtones. It played on the idea of, once again, of Kiev and Rus, that there is a common spiritual historic space uh, between Russians and Ukrainians that is, of course, led by um, the Russian Orthodox Church and specifically the Moscow Patriarchate. And it traded also on Soviet rhetoric that's highly gendered. They use the word fraternal nations, uh, suggesting that Rus, back to Kiev and Rus, really unites the East Slavic peoples in one confessional group. And this is what's used to posit that Russians and Ukrainians are really one people. Not to be outdone, uh, the Ukrainians have countered with a similar kind of concept called the Kievan tradition that they posit celebrates ecumenicism and feeds religious pluralism. They claim that they can do this uh, because of this um, history of having been a meeting place of empires that they bridge as their very, the very name of the country suggests, they bridge East and West, Europe and Asia. And specifically they bridge Catholicism and Orthodoxy. That is to say Eastern and Western forms of Christianity. So those concepts and religion more broadly has been weaponized to the extent that uh, an independent uh, national church formed only in December 2018. This church, uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, is independent of the Russian Orthodox Church. And it was a deliberate, although there have been attempts over the years to create such an independent church, um, the need became acute. Uh, under the conditions of this hybrid war. And it was seen as a means of challenging the uh, influence of the Russian Orthodox Church and the status of the Moscow Patriarchate and the Russian Orthodox Church more globally. And in doing so, um, it reaffirms the status of the ecumenical patriarchate in Constantinople, as they call it, which is of course, Istanbul, 
And given that the Greek Orthodox Church has recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, you start having a recalibration of power relationships that forge alliances on the basis of religion that are going to start bringing Ukraine uh, into a, a, a European space more closely. It also opens up uh, a whole can of worms. Um, Ukraine has, um, for many reasons, been um, uh, a, a region of the, of, of the Russian Empire that had a great uh, more, a great deal more churches and was religiously active more, more, more broadly. Three of the five most important monasteries for Eastern Slavs are in Ukraine. At the time that the Soviet Union collapsed, fully one half of the Russian Orthodox Church churches, their church buildings were in Ukraine. Now it's down to about a third, but that's in the face of extensive church building on the Russian part. The question arises then, what about all the clergy, the parishioners? not to mention the revenue of these Orthodox Church, who does that belong to now? All, all of this by way of saying that this is a, a means uh, of reducing the influence of not just Russia within Ukraine, but Russia via Orthodoxy with, within Ukraine. And it's a, uh, a, a weapon, if you will, of fighting back against Mr. Putin by um, reducing the influence of the Moscow Patriarchate um, more broadly. Here's a graph, and I apologize for the fact that it's uh, in Ukrainian, but the numbers I hope will, will speak to you nonetheless. Um, this uh, independent church was created literally three years ago, but it now already is the single largest faith group in Ukraine. Um, and it's largely picking up members uh, at the expense of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, which is what the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine has to, that's its name in, U in, in Ukraine. So in other words, being sort of an amorphous believer or pledging some kind of an amorphous, a soft confessional kind of allegiance to orthodoxy is becoming increasingly untenable. And we see, um, a similar kind of development in, in a linguistics arena, which I'd be happy to talk about in terms of tendency, tensions between speaking Russian and Ukrainian. Um, but it's an attempt to, if you will, securitize increasingly religion. So you have a move to create denominational boundaries that are meant to mirror state borders and not just mirror them, but actively reinforce them. Given that religion then takes on that kind of uh, a responsibility, we see a rise of militarism um, among church officials and among the um, um, various uh, rituals and uh, public pronouncements that um, those who are religiously inclined, be they lay practitioners or be they religious officials, that is going to embrace militarism. And in Ukraine, the dynamic it comes from a, a different direction than it does in Russia. In Ukraine, we have a massive expansion of the military chaplaincy and military chaplains then have taken on roles um, in various humanitarian, um, uh, such as serving in, in hospitals, in schools, in orphanages, uh, as well as in all kinds of transportation centers and the like. In, in Russia, the militarism comes much more from a, 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 a state, a top-down um, dynamic. But all of this comes to a head when you have a very significant representation of the, uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, as I mentioned, under the, the guise of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. And pressure was um, uh, been placed on this church to actively change its name to uh, acknowledge that it is really the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Thus far, uh, this of course is being challenged in the courts and that has not yet happened. But here's where you see then this um, active militarization um, and the conflation of piety and patriotism as being inherently part of uh, being Ukrainian today. Uh, this, a similar thing is happening in Russia, as I mentioned. Uh, here you see uh, a spectacular and grandiose uh, cathedral that was recently built outside of Moscow. And this is dedicated to the armed forces. And it's of course in camo green, but it is uh, enormous 
uh, and you can see the, this lower um, photograph shows the interior of the church. All this by way of saying, what we see in the region is that religious organizations, religious leaders, and anyone who is at all affiliated with religion and, uh, and the presence of religious uh, religiosity, I would say more broadly, is beginning to become freighted with all kinds of other uh, tasks under the conditions of this hybrid war. One of which is that religion is increasingly, both in Ukraine and in Russia, seen as an expression of national identity and in particular, a means to generate and maintain national solidarity. So it becomes inherent in who you are. In other words, to be Ukrainian is to be Orthodox, to be Russian is to be Orthodox. In Ukraine, an exception, if you will, or an expansion is made in the Western parts of, of Ukraine because the country is very variable regionally in terms of religious confession, whereby it's an Eastern Christian form of Catholicism is then a fundamental uh, component of a national identity. It also becomes, um, Religion becomes a carrier of cultural heritage, which means then that religious institutions become interpreters of the past, um, commemorating certain historical figures, historical events, um, becomes the responsibility of religious institutions. And so you have then religious institutions that are actively crafting uh, new kinds of national narratives that either in the case of Russia, for example, celebrate Kievan Rus once again, or celebrate um, the Soviet victory during World War II as having been made only possible because of the unity of these um, Slavic brother, uh, brotherly nations, or on the Ukrainian side, the idea of this ecumenicism, and which dovetails with pluralism and democracy, and the fact that uh, by looking uh, at Ukrainian history, they point to the various moments in which uh, Ukrainians were, uh, and specifically for their religiosity, were repressed uh, in the uh, Russian Empire and especially in the Soviet Union. Religion also becomes, as I mentioned earlier, very much a delineator of state borders. And as such, um, uh, religious denominations then are uh, made to mirror and fortify borders. And that's because they begin to dovetail with not just personal security, which of course a great many Ukrainians are tremendously concerned about these days, but also the national security. And that's why we've moved in this hybrid war, in this latest chapter of troop buildup uh, along the Ukrainian borders of not just weaponizing religion, but even securitizing it. But in both instances, we have um, religion, I think, becoming um, on one side, uh, on the Ukrainian side, uh, mobilized as, as uh, a weapon, if you will, of, uh, of the weak to the extent that Ukraine is, of course, um, outarmed and outmanned and in every other which way, uh, militarily has very few chances against any kind and continued Russian aggression. So hence you have the reliance on this, um, uh, on religion as a way to um, respond under the conditions of a hybrid war. I mention all of this because I think these tactics of hybrid warfare um, are effective, they are low risk, and they leave the adversary with uh, very little in the way of a response. And they certainly do not generate the kind of international outcry um, that let's say this massive troop um, buildup on Ukraine's borders has. Um, and for that reason, I believe they will continue to uh, persist. Um, and I think if there's, if, if uh, anything has come out of this, I, we see that the persistent recourse to violence serves to consolidate, whether one speaks about consolidating uh, a fragile Ukrainian nation, or whether it, we're talking about consolidating NATO itself. I began by saying, I don't think this is really about NATO, but I think NATO um, um, has been activated. Uh, this is much more about the European Union, and that too, I think, has been fortified. So all of these are the, some of the consequences of this hybrid war and tactics of hybrid warfare that include weaponizing things such as information and religion. So perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there and turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Donna Berry. Uh, 
So I think uh, Kathy mentioned at the outset that uh, Putin has, seems to be driven by frustrated imperial ambitions. Although I, I think I might modify that slightly and say they haven't been that frustrated in many cases. So what I want to do is uh, talk about what's behind um, the Russian military buildup uh, and what we might expect to see. So I won't be talking specifically about religion, but clearly um, the religious conflict uh, is part of a larger uh, fight, uh, a hybrid fight about culture and who belongs to, to which culture. Uh, driven by, uh, by Russia's efforts to reincorporate or at least reassert influence um, over the former uh, Soviet states. Um, so Russia's government uh, under Putin since 2000, most especially um, in about the last 10 to 15 years, uh, has pushed to reassert Russian hegemony over the former USSR and to preempt EU and NATO expansion. And as Kathy mentioned, uh, NATO has been one of the key bugbears, but the more uh, realistic uh, issue uh, for Ukraine especially is over association and potential membership with the EU. Why that might be, um, well, I think Kathy also hit an important point here uh, about um, Putin's uh, grip on power and efforts to sort of keep his model of uh, political economy and uh, political uh, hegemony uh, functioning in Russia. Um, since the early 2000s, there have been a number of color revolutions. The Maidan revolution in Ukraine in 2014 was one, but there was a previous one in 2004 um, in which people rose up against an attempt to by an incumbent pro-Russian president to throw an election. Uh, there was a color revolution so-called in 2003 in post-Soviet Georgia. And in each of these cases, the revolutions drove out sort of pro-Russian uh, leaders and brought in uh, leaders who were more pro-Western, more inclined toward moving toward the EU. Uh, well, since those have happened, one thing that the Russian government has done in the Putin era is literally to institutionalize courses and training in the military in schools against color revolutions. In other words, against popular revolts uh, from the bottom up to try and drive out corrupt uh, and authoritarian leaders. Uh, so concern about uh, potential uh, color revolution is definitely, seems to be definitely part of the calculus in the Kremlin. Uh, and not just because it poses a threat uh, to Russia itself, but color revolutions on the borderland, especially borderland countries that share language and, and history, uh, pose the problem of a thriving democratic uh, neighbor with uh, hopefully a thriving privately based economy uh, really would undermine uh, the legitimacy uh, of the current Russian state. There's one more reason too, I think that uh, seems to motivate uh, Russia's efforts to expand its influence uh, in the post-Soviet space. And that has to do with Russia's economy. We know um, from uh, Soviet history that the Soviet Union had problems uh, developing um, industrial products that were saleable and high quality and that could be exported. So the Soviet Union had uh, pretty severe economic problems as uh, time wore on. Russia too still has some of the same problems. Um, it's not uh, been particularly successful at developing um, industrial type uh, export products other than military hardware. Uh, and indeed much of Russia's uh, export uh, earnings comes still from uh, primary products, oil and natural gas, of course, also timber and other uh, primary goods. And it's striking if you go back even to 1913, that was Russia's, those were Russia's uh, exports as well. Why does that matter? Partly because um, it looks as though President Putin is attempting to create, uh, to expand his economic union, it's now called the Eurasian Economic Community, um, to include um, other countries of the post-Soviet space uh, in customs union, potentially they're talking about um, uh, monetary union, which of course would use the Russian ruble. 
Well, Ukraine would be a prize in that sense. With 44 million people, it's the largest uh, of the post-Soviet states by population. It would be a market uh, for Russian goods. And of course, uh, Ukraine has uh, still defense industries inherited from the old Soviet Union, natural resources and so on. But um, I'm gonna talk more about the more proximate uh, issues that seem to be driving the current uh, the current effort to intimidate Ukraine. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, Russia under Putin has uh, attempted to sort of reassert hegemony by different mechanisms, as it turns out, certainly by peaceful means uh, since the early 2000s. Uh, for example, the Russian government has been overtly involved in some elections, uh, as in the case of Ukraine, 2004. The incumbent president at the time, Leonid Kuchma, was term limited uh, and so recruited a uh, proxy candidate, if you will, or a handpicked candidate, uh, Viktor Yanukovych here on the right, both of these from Eastern Ukraine, both of them pro-Russian, and himself here, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, sent campaign advisors to work with Yanukovych, came to um, Ukraine uh, to if not overtly campaign for Yanukovych, at least to lend support, uh, visual uh, support. Uh, unfortunately, this is the election in 2004 where people rose up in the Orange Revolution uh, and ultimately where the uh, authorities tried to uh, throw the election to Yanukovych, but where eventually uh, a legitimate vote and a valid count uh, were inst instituted and Yanukovych lost didn't sit well with uh, President Putin. Apart from elections, the Russian government has, of course, been promoting Russian media and language uh, in post-Soviet states. And Russia has invested a pretty substantial amount uh, into uh, uh, transnational uh, media sources like Russia Today, RT, and others. Uh, and not just in post-Soviet states, but clearly uh, the post-Soviet states are a primary focus. Um, peaceful means have included this European uh, uh, economic union, rather Eurasian economic union, which is supposed to be modeled somewhat like the EU, but whereas the EU tends to be um, more um, collaborative, shall we say, in the case of the Eurasian economic community, it's Russia top down establishing most of the rules, even to the extent of disadvantaging uh, some of the members. Uh, and uh, the Russian government has used subsidies, for example, on gas prices, natural gas prices to different countries. Um, the gas prices have differed at different times over recent years uh, by about 200 to 300% uh, Russian gas provided to uh, post-Soviet uh, and European clients. Uh, the favored countries uh, get uh, charged um, one third or sometimes even less what other countries pay. Other peaceful means have included um, <clears throat> what's come to be known as passportization. Uh, in this case, the Russian government offers passports to uh, residents and citizens of other post-Soviet states uh, 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 to become Russian citizens. And what that means is that the Russian government also then announces that it has an obligation to protect Russian citizens in these neighboring states. In the case of Ukraine, the most recent data I've seen, or at least an estimate, suggests that there have been almost a million uh, Russian passports, Russian citizens uh, recruited um, in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine. Well, those are the peaceful mechanisms, but there's also coercion, as we're seeing now, uh, so cyber attacks have been a very prominent part of this hybrid war that Kathy described. Cyber attacks on uh, governments in post-Soviet states and especially targeting Ukraine, and especially since 2014, uh, cyber attacks on businesses and on infrastructure uh, as well, uh, which could potentially literally shut down the entire country. Uh, boycott, Russian boycotts of goods, uh, rejecting, for example, food and wine from Ukraine or from Moldova or Georgia when uh, leaders in those countries uh, do something that the Russian government or uh, President Putin uh, dislike. 
There's been uh, other means of coercion, such as financial pressure and cutoffs of energy supplies. Uh, this has happened to Ukraine in the past. I think it was in January of 2009, for example, uh, when uh, the Russian uh, company Gazprom cut off gas just about the height of winter over uh, payments uh, for Russian gas. But there's also coercion uh, by overt military force. There's been a war with Georgia in 2008. And as a result, Russia occupied uh, two Georgian provinces. Um, there have been calls, at least in one of these provinces, to be annexed to Russia, but so far the Russian government has resisted uh, that option. And of course, we've seen the annexation of Crimea in the war in eastern Ukraine uh, starting in 2014. Uh, and coercion has been most intense and extensive where ex-Soviet countries have leaned toward the EU uh, and NATO, apart from the Baltics, which broke away early. Uh, so Georgia, as I mentioned, has seen the occupation of two of its provinces, Abkhazia uh, and South Ossetia, uh, since 2008. Uh, Moldova, uh, another uh, Western, uh, post-Soviet Western located geographically post-Soviet state, has had a breakaway province that announced its uh, independence back in the, the end of the Soviet Union. And the Russian government uh, has been supporting this breakaway province called Transnistria, uh, as the Moldovan government has been uh, attempting to, has actually signed an association agreement with the EU and has been attempting to uh, move closer to uh, Europe. Uh, and of course, uh, Ukraine uh, has experienced its uh, the annexation of Crimea and the war in East Ukraine. Uh, so this is most assuredly, uh, coercion has been uh, directed most intensely at the three post-Soviet countries that have been most actively looking for uh, connections to the EU and as Kathy mentioned, somewhat less connection to NATO. Then the question is, if the Russian government uh, is uh, driven to reassert this hegemony, why not just take over whole countries? It could well have taken Georgia uh, in 2008. And Putin himself has announced that uh, Russian troops couldn't have taken all of Ukraine in 2014, or at least attempted to. Well, but it turns out limited incursions are obviously less costly for the Russian side, less costly in terms of finances and certainly of personnel. Um, the limited incursions have aimed at the areas most favorable to Russia, as in the two eastern uh, provinces in Ukraine and Crimea. And limited incursions uh, turn out to be enough to exert leverage and preempt EU and NATO membership without, uh, in, in, again, in, uh, incurring uh, massive costs. So, for example, the two parts of Ukraine that were subject to Russian interference in 2014 uh, were Crimea, which was the only ethnic Russian majority province at the time, still it was, and the two breakaway eastern regions had ethnic Ukrainian majorities, but um, Russian speaking. And this plays into um, the map and the discussion that Kathy mentioned about Western uh, versus Eastern Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine, uh, the, dominant Russian, the dominant language had been uh, uh, Russian in everyday use, although that of course has been changing since 2014. And the two Eastern regions and Crimea both had uh, economic uh, ties to Russia. Uh, so limited incursions turn out to be more useful for uh, Putin's purposes. And the purpose seems to be um, to assert hegemony, to prevent uh, these countries from moving toward the EU in particular, but also toward NATO, and to keep them off balance, to keep the governments themselves, the internal governments divided over how to deal with these territorial uh, difficulties. So the question is, why now? So this has been an ongoing conflict, but why did it ratchet up um, in the past year, especially there are a couple of reasons, and then I'll uh, go through these and, and then we'll stop. So um, over the past year, there's been a water war between Russia and Ukraine uh, over Crimea. Uh, Crimea has had a drought and water rationing now uh, for two years. 
Part of the reason is because the Ukrainian government cut off most fresh water supplies to Ukraine uh, after uh, crime, uh, to Crimea rather, uh, after it was annexed by Russia. And hauling in bottled water over the Kerch Bridge uh, is not sufficient. So this is a, an ongoing conflict. Uh, why more pressure now? The Ukrainian government under President Zelensky since 2019 is tackling oligarchs and corruption, which have been major problems ever since 1991. Uh, and thereby reducing Russia's political and economic influence on high Ukrainian politics. The key example is uh, in this past year, starting in February, the Ukrainian government indicted one of the uh, key political players closest to Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, a man named Medvedchuk, indicted him for treason and closed his three Russian language TV channels uh, in 2021. So Putin's peaceful means of in exerting influence on high politics uh, are being uh, cut back, uh, dramatically cut back. So let me stop there. I was gonna talk about possible scenarios. The one last thing I would mention is actually the Russian government gains uh, a fair amount just by maintaining the threat, keeping the troops around. Uh, Ukraine, because what that does is it suspends investors' uh, willingness to invest uh, because they're waiting to see what happens. So foreign investment is declining, as well as domestic investment being held up. So Ukraine's economy is suffering. From the Russian standpoint, uh, standpoint an international crisis means uh, international concerns about the supplies of oil and gas coming out of Russia and the international market. So the prices of oil and gas have gone up and Russia's uh, fiscal coffers have uh, grown by 50% more even than Russian economists and uh, the treasury in Russia had anticipated at the beginning of 2021. So let me stop there. The crisis uh, is redounding to Russia's benefit even without an invasion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Donna, um, for all of that wonderful commentary. We have several questions already in the chat and in the Q&A. Sophie asked, for example, how does Ukraine then see itself entering Europe given the pronounced secularity in Europe and its uh, legislation that in, uh, includes things like protection for LGBTQ rights and reproductive choice? Um, and uh, you're, you're right that uh, that is um, uh, a hot button issue. And for that specific reason, the Russian world uh, embraces what it calls traditional values. So it takes a, a polar opposite stance um, and uh, collaborates with the World Congress of Families, which is an American evangelical, highly conservative group to promote what it calls traditional uh, family values. This is of course, it, it just adds further strain within Ukraine. Um, I would say the issue of reproductive choice falls on fairly deaf ears. I mean, the USSR was one of the first places to allow for divorce on demand and abortion and the like. So I think there's fairly widespread support for reproductive choice. I cannot say the same for LGBTQ rights, um, but uh, I think it's important to note that in the interests of cultivating favor with European officials, uh, you do have uh, enormous, an enormous show of state um, uh, force protecting those who uh, engage in, let's say, gay pride. I've made it a point to go to gay pride every year for years now, um, and it is growing, but it is under enormous police protection. And one of the reasons why it has remained uh, fairly uh, peaceful is because they understand that um, European membership, EU membership uh, hangs in the wings. And it's for that reason that, e that many religious organizations who might not at all be supportive of LGBTQ rights, uh, nonetheless refrain from uh, encouraging any kind of uh, protest against uh, gay pride or gay rights. Um, another question came up about uh, language and language rights. Um, it's often been said that um, Vladimir Putin uh, uses human rights um, uh, concepts that he's protecting compatriots in uh, Russia and specifically Russian speakers whose rights are being infringed upon by the Ukrainian government. Um, this is just an utterly, um, uh, it would be a ridiculous claim if it 
didn't have a very, very tangible and very harsh reality. Um, as the questioner, Sophie once again uh, noted, uh, the current president of Ukraine and multiple presidents before him have been primarily Ukrainian speakers. Um, the current president has uh, fairly recently, in fact, begun to speak with any kind of regularity in Ukrainian. He, um, he is from Eastern Ukraine and he's clearly, uh, uh, his primary first language is clearly Russian. Um, and that uh, as, a, as an anthropologist by training, I constantly go back and forth in different regions and uh, begin to speak uh, whatever the non-dominant language is just to see what people's reactions are. And at a bare bones minimum, I can say after extensive um, uh, time spent in this part of the world, at a bare bones minimum, just 100% of the people in Ukraine are at least passively fluent in Russian. And it's uh, an enormous amount of, uh, of business and all kinds of other forms of interaction are done uh, continu continuously in Russian. Having said that, as part of this hybrid war, just as we see the securitization of uh, religion, you also see then uh, the choice of language, what language to print something in, what language to conduct business in, what, what language to speak in public. This is, the pendulum is swinging very sharply towards Ukrainian. And I do think if things carry on with this hybrid war for much longer, they are going to lose a generation of Russian speakers. Uh, it's already out of the schools, um, but we're to the point, I, I just was corresponding with a friend today that for example, many booksellers are refusing to sell books written in Russian. Many, many libraries are referring, are refusing to carry books written in Russian. Um, and this, once again, I see all of this as uh, uh, the weapons of the week. Um, if you were a bookseller and if you felt that the existential existence of your country was under threat, this is a response that is available to you. And so the pendulum is swinging the other way in terms of language. But the tragedy of it all was that um, for the 30 years in this post, since the collapse of the USSR, um, there was rampant, uh, uh, what, what's called what linguists called non-reciprocal bilingualism. That is to say people were entirely fluent in both languages and, and casually used them both depending on the situation. Okay, well, two things briefly. Um, after President Putin announced the policy of issuing passports to the folks in East Ukraine, the Ukrainian parliament in 2019, I guess it was uh, adopted a language law uh, giving priority, increasing priority for Ukrainian language. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the government has been focusing on that. The other question here is about the Russian Duma and recognition of sovereignty of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, initially, at least, that is a, that's a symbolic uh, gesture. They did, did that, for example, with uh, the two breakaway regions in Georgia that are now occupied by Russian forces. Uh, but it's a first step toward getting uh, other countries to recognize these regions as independent. Um, it, but it takes a majority of the world's U United Nations members to actually make that uh, independence official, to have it be recognized by the international community. And the odds are extremely low that that would happen. So it's symbolic, at least for the time being. I think one of the results of these hybrid wars is uh, what are called frozen conflicts. Mm -hmm. You have permanent sub-state structures. And the concern of that for all of us is the fact that these uh, sub-state structures embedded in frozen conflicts tend to be uh, fairly lawless. It's unclear uh, or, or have laws unto themselves, I guess is perhaps how one should say it. Looking at just at Transnistria, for example, in Moldova, which is on Ukraine's Western border, um, uh, it's an enormous site of trafficking of human beings, of guns, drugs, and the like. So that is also one of the consequences of these hybrid wars. They yield uh, not necessarily new states, or uh, uh, but these they're not intended to, because it's actually uh, more beneficial to have these frozen conflicts that can more easily be exploited. The problem is, uh, especially for the Eastern republics, um, those uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, now they have essentially been reduced to rubble. I mean, anyone who inherits those um, 
that region, be it Russia or Ukraine, is instantaneously going to be faced with uh, enormous expense in terms of rebuilding roads, schools, hospitals, and the like. Um, the infrastructure has basically um, uh, been bombed to the ground. Um, and some argue that uh, Ukraine should let it go because those are perhaps those who are not as uh, um, uh, supportive of this EU orientation and, uh, and an effort to um, pursue a different path, a different future that, in other words, not to see the past as then dictating what their future um, uh, political development of the country or religious uh, development of the country might be. Um, but the rhetorically, at least both sides, you have, um, as Donna mentioned, this passportization. Many people in that region have been given, they're Ukrainian citizens, but they've been given Russian passports. Um, so they potentially could relocate to Russia. And this is a way for Russia to, um, once again, in this hybrid kind of fashion, um, formally, but in an ironclad way, sort of annex those territories and further uh, the development of the Russian Orthodox Church to return to the uh, uh, topic of religion and all of this. Um, and to continue to allow um, the Russian Orthodox Church, for example, um, uh, to be used in aspects of fighting this war. Um, it's churches that are by and large um, arsenals of weaponry and uh, because it's they, they're daring each other to bomb it. No one wants to bomb a church. So for that reason, uh, they become arsenals. Um, and the whole issue of pluralism, um, many Ukrainians make the case that um, the kinds of legislation that um, are increasingly embraced in Ukraine, which had a moment when they were more liberal, but under these kinds of circumstances, um, they, uh, with the rise of militarism and the like under these uh, hybrid war conditions, are um, narrow, that liberalism is narrowing. And that's of course a, a, a tremendous concern. Well, thank you so much, um, Kathy. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, perhaps those of you who still have questions lingering could send an email uh, to Kathy, although I'm guessing that she's very busy. Actually, I know she's very busy right now, so it may take a bit of time um, for her to get back to and, and just look for her on the news. Um, and, and you can still continue to learn a lot um, through these other venues. And thank you, Donna, as well, for being here tonight and contributing to the conversation. This was very, very rich. Um, and, and very helpful, especially for those of us who don't work in that part of the world. Um, and, and we're very curious to know more. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Thank you and to everyone for being here. This recording will be available. Um, I also quickly want to highlight um, one of our biggest events of the year, which is the Harshbarger Lecture in Religious Studies. This year, it will be Dr. Kathy Joshi, um, from Fairleigh Dixon uh, University, who will be talking about her new book, White Christian Privilege, The Illusion of Religious Equity in America.